I think we'll get started uh, tonight. Welcome for, uh, to week two of the Community Justice Academy. Um, uh, for those of you who were not here last week, uh, obviously what we did last week is we had Detective uh, Brian Schimenauer, uh, who um, was the lead investigator on the uh, cases that we've uh, discussed last week and we'll discuss again uh, tonight. Uh, as I said at the time, you know, part of what our thought process was in doing this is that uh, you know, we believe that a lot of the public, and the you know, same for me, you know, when I'm not serving as prosecutor, is all you know about uh, any particular incident is uh, you know a crime occurred when you see that uh, in the press. Uh, you know that perhaps arrest has been made uh, because you see that, and then at some point down the road you see a resolution. And so what, what we wanted to do in this presentation was to fill in the gaps and everything that was involved in getting from day one to getting to, in this case, conviction of six defendants. Uh, and and uh, as I, I thought about last week's presentation, uh, one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that in spite of the fact that Detective Schimenauer covered a lot of information that uh, he developed in the course of the investigation, uh, I'm sure you appreciate that really he only scratched the surface uh, of everything that he did and the other investigators did to uh, lead to the point where those six defendants could be charged. And some of that additional uh, information and evidence that was developed uh, through the investigation actually will be apparent tonight uh, in the presentation by our deputy prosecutors. Um, one um, last note, uh, and again, as of last week, um, some of the <laughs> materials that will be presented will be graphic, uh, and uh, we talked about this internally before we uh, put together the presentation, and, and we felt it important uh, that we not sanitize uh, any aspect of what occurred. Uh, that, that, that we uh, felt that the public uh, and you need to understand that this is what real life looks like, uh, and, and this is what looks like in these investigations. Um, I'm not a I'm not a Baptist pastor, so I, <laughs> if I if I were, I'd say, can I get an amen here? <laughs> uh, so um, um, our two presenters tonight are the two deputy prosecutors who were the lead uh, deputy prosecutors in the case, uh, Ross Anderson and Jeremy Typen. I'm going to read a little bit about their introduction. Uh, but uh, before I do, I um, had a surprise guest here tonight. Uh, Annie Anderson is here, who is the wife of uh, Ross Anderson and their newborn baby, Wade. Uh, Ross Anderson is a deputy prosecutor and supervisor in our office. Uh, Ross has been with the Marion County Prosecutor's Office for 12 years and currently serves as the major felony supervisor in Criminal Court 1. Ross previously acted as the designated arson prosecutor in the Special Crimes Unit prosecuting all arson cases in Marion County. His current caseload focuses on prosecuting homicides. Uh, Jeremy Typen is likewise a deputy prosecutor in our office. He has been with the office uh, 13 years and is currently assigned to the Special Crimes Unit, which is responsible for working closely with law enforcement agencies to file murder and attempted murder cases. Jeremy previously acted as a supervisor in charge of the Felony Screening Division, and his current caseload also focuses on prosecuting homicides. With that, we'll turn it over to Ross and Jeremy. Thank you, Terry. I'm Ross Anderson, and this is Jeremy, in case that wasn't clear. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, playing a bit of the 911 call that uh, got the ball rolling, so to speak, in this particular case. Might be a little soft, so bear with me. Now we're, we're okay. There's, there's a uh, line of people showing up. Anybody do anything to 
person of the job? We're trying to, we have to, a wire tie around his neck. We can't get it cut off. He's worried about his oxygen flow. How did he get a wire tie around his neck? He said he tied him up and tried to shoot him, and he, he got away. Okay, is, is he bleeding from anywhere right now? Bleeding from his uh, arm, his voice, you know. Okay, yeah, that's he can't just take a clean drive off and hold pressure on his arm where he's bleeding from. Okay, the ambulance is on the way for him. They'll be there as quickly as they can. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> this is Thomas Keyes, his cousin, who called him that morning. And Thomas was a DJ. He was into music, and he, he and uh, Marvin both like to mix music, like to hang out with people who mix music and, and rap. And that morning, Thomas had called Marvin and said, hey, got some guys that want us to come by their studio, see if we can uh, mix some music with them, play some, play some songs. And Marvin agreed. Thomas picked him up later that day and took him to a studio at right around 46th and Keystone. It was a studio that Marvin hadn't been to before, but he'd heard about it. He was familiar with it. And when they got inside the studio, he immediately saw a couple of individuals who he recognized. The first person that he came into contact with was this man, Dante Robinson. Marvin had never actually met Dante before, but he, knowing individuals who also worked in the music scene around Indianapolis, had seen his work before. Common thing uh, to put your music on YouTube, and so he was watching videos of other people who were doing the same thing. He would put his own music out there, and that's how Marvin had seen Dante Robinson before. The next person he saw was the individual on the far left, James McDuffie. And James McDuffie is somebody that Marvin had met before at a concert, so he was familiar with who he was. Marvin and Thomas went inside the studio and they were expecting to play some music, listen to some music, mix some music with some of these other guys. But things quickly changed as soon as they got inside and they quickly realized that something, something very bad was going to happen that day. As soon as they got into the main studio, James McDuffie pulled out a gun. He said, you two need to sit down. We want to know who killed our friend Bango. We think you know who did it. And y'all are going to tell us who did this, or you're not going home tonight. Now Marvin had no idea what they were talking about, and neither did Thomas Keyes. Bango was another local rapper who had been murdered shortly before this incident took place. They'd heard about it, they had nothing to do with it. But here were these two men confronting him saying, you know what's going on and you're going to tell us what happened. Marvin and Thomas, obviously all he could do is say, we don't know anything. You know, we're just here to mix music and we can't answer these questions for you, but that wasn't good enough. Things got more intense when Marvin looked over and saw that Dante Robinson was holding an assault rifle. And soon other members of this group joined inside the studio, including Nathaniel Armstrong on the far right, and then above him to the left, Dominic Hamler. Dominic Hamler came in with an assault rifle as well. Marvin Finney said that he had nothing to do with it, but it was clear very quickly that this group didn't want to hear any of that. They were looking for blood. And they kept threatening and saying, hey, you need to tell us what you know. You're not going home tonight. And then things got more aggressive. Out came duct tape and zip ties. And Marvin and Thomas were bound up with duct tape and zip ties. They were beaten or threatened at one point. Thomas was slashed by a box cutter. Still, they said, we don't know what's going on. We can't, we can't tell you what happened to Bango. That wasn't good enough. The group, these men, got more riled up. They started playing 
some of Bango's music on their cell phones as if they were trying to get themselves fired up, excited about getting revenge. And at that point, it was pretty clear that something bad was very, something very bad was going to happen. Marvin was talking to his cousin, and, and Thomas was talking back. And at one point, the members of the group were telling or discussing among themselves how they were going to kill Marvin and Thomas. They said, "Should we douse them in gasoline and light them on fire? Should we electrocute them? Should we just strangle them to death?" Marvin was hearing all of this. And as things got worse, and as soon as it became very clear that they weren't going to make it out of there, Marvin leaned over to his cousin and just said, I love you guys. I'm so sorry I got you into this. Out came more zip ties, which were wrapped around both Marvin and Thomas's neck. They were choking, they were pulled tight. The lights were shut out. The men walked out the door in the studio that they were in, and one person popped back in, and gunfire rang out. Marvin could hear Thomas being struck by bullets, and he himself was struck by bullets as well. Not knowing what to do, he just fell to the floor and laid there, and he didn't move. He was hoping that he could just pretend he was dead and that they would leave. But as he was laying there, he could hear Thomas slowly dying, her life going from his body. But it worked. The men did leave. And Marvin, as soon as he thought the coast was clear, got up, broke out of the zip ties around his wrists, tried to make sure that they weren't outside waiting for him, and got out of the studio. The zip tie still wrapped around his neck, as you heard from the 911 call, and ran to the CVS. It was just two blocks away at 46 and Keystone. Still duct tapes, still wrapped up. And it was there that people at CVS found him, and the police came to talk to him about what had happened. At the moment that they came into contact with Marvin, he could only tell him I was down the street at a studio, and I think my cousin's dead. <coughs> so the police quickly responded to that scene, and I'm going to play, play a little bit of the crime scene video so that you all can see what they found. Now, again, this is going to be a little bit graphic, and if anybody needs to step out, now's the time to do so. This is from inside the studio. This is what the police found when they arrived. <coughs> this is the back of the studio. And as you saw, there was some blood on that door. That's where Marvin Finney first tried to get out.
the crime scene specialist who shot that video, Margaret LeBlanc, then exits the studio at the front door and really just follows the blood trail that leads all the way to the CVS, uh, documenting exactly the path that Martin Finney took uh, while he, when he fled from that studio that day. Now, Detective Ryan Sheminar explained a little bit of his investigation, but I know that there are some people here who were not here last week, so I'll share um, the subsequent follow-up that he did. When Detective Sheminar responded to the scene, and you may have seen in that last shot in the crime scene video, he noticed a few things. Obviously, there are a number of zip ties lying around, there's duct tape, uh, and he saw a package. And when he looked at that empty package, you know, it looked fairly, fairly new, and he had some sort of app or device on his phone that allowed him to scan the product's barcode. And when he did that, he noticed it was a product that was unique to Lowe's, a bag of zip ties that you, you don't just get anywhere, specific to a Lowe's brand. The next day, obviously, knowing that information, he did go to the Lowe's. And just on a whim, asked the loss prevention manager there, a man named Braden Pothier. This may sound strange, but did you notice anything, anything unusual yesterday, like a couple people buying unusual objects like zip ties or duct tape? And he said, well, actually, now that you mention that, I absolutely did. And the loss prevention manager went on to describe how the day before, three individuals had come in and had caught his attention for a couple different reasons, but the most unusual of which was the fact that while they were looking at zip ties in a certain aisle, one of the men was holding a package of zip ties, and the other one was kind of crossing his wrists like this, as if they were kind of comparing the size of the zip ties to human wrists to see if they were big enough to fit around them. As you can imagine, this uh, perked or this uh, piqued Detective Schemenauer's interest, and he said, hey, do you have video? And they sure did. The loss prevention manager actually had spent some time watching these particular individuals, following them on camera, uh, because of the unusual behavior that he, he had seen. And Lowe's had pretty good video footage, I'll tell you that. And we'll look at a little bit that a little bit of that here shortly. Ultimately, based on what he found on that videotape, as well as what Marvin Finney later told him about who he saw in that studio and what had happened to him, Detective Schemenauer pieced together information linking six individuals to that crime. That being James McDuffie, Dante Robinson, Dominic Hamler, James McDuffie, but also two other individuals, Carlton Hart, and Darren Jackson. Whenever a detective investigates a case, at some point he's going to bring it to our office for what we call screening. And that part of the process is where the detective brings his case file to us, shows us what information he has in his investigation so far at that point, and says, what, what charges can I file? And it's our job as a prosecutor's office to take a look at, at the evidence he has and say, well, you don't have enough or yes, you do have enough at this point to, to file charges. Now, this point is not all, obviously the end all and be all of the investigation. Oftentimes, we'll file charges uh, knowing that there will be additional investigation uh, going forward. Sometimes, the fact that the detective brings a file, and there's not enough information that we think we can you know, have probable cause to file charges on, we'll tell them to go do some more work. Uh, in this case, when Detective Schemenauer brought this case to us, uh, five of the six in individuals were originally screened for filing. Darren Jackson, uh, we have subsequently filed charges on at a later time. There are a whole slew of charges that we filed in this particular case, and these individuals were not all charged with these things, and we'll discuss a little bit about why that was or wasn't done for certain individuals as we go forward. But we knew um, at the outset of the investigation that we had a couple issues to face. As you'll see from the video, three of these individuals are on video at Lowe's. 
purchasing these items that were used, I mean the duct tape and zip ties and, and the board that was used to, to barricade the door. And those were James McDuffie, Carlton Hart, and Darren Jackson. Some of the other individuals involved obviously were only at the studio. They were not involved in the purchase of those items. And that obviously creates an issue when we're talking about who to charge, what to charge them with, and what theory of criminal liability we can level against them. But as you see, there were a number of different charges that we decided on uh, for various individuals. Murder, felony murder, conspiracy to commit murder, robbery causing serious bodily injury, uh, confinement and kidnapping, and also conspiracy to commit confinement and conspiracy to commit kidnapping. The reason that we had to use some of these charges was because there would be obviously a question in any future jurors' minds about criminal liability for someone who was perhaps at the Lowe's but didn't stick around at the studio, or you know, vice versa, somebody who wasn't at the Lowe's at the outset but was at the studio when the committee was acts. What we have to do as prosecutors when we have a situation like this is rely on a couple different theories of legal liability. One is what's called accomplice liability. This is uh, the classic accomplice liability instruction. It's somebody who knowingly aids or induces or causes another person to commit an offense. If you do that, you are technically committing that offense. And in jury selection, or whenever we discuss this kind of an issue with the jury, our classic example that we use is a bank robbery where several people, people are involved. Uh, one person's at the wheel in the car outside, one person's standing guard at the door with a machine gun, somebody goes in and you know, holds up the tellers and somebody goes into the vault inside the bank. And we ask the jury as well, you know, who's, who's guilty, who's responsible legally for committing a bank robbery? We we'll get a, very, a variety of answers, but you know, when you look at the accomplice liability instruction, it's pretty clear. Did you help? Did you aid or induce? Did you facilitate or make that crime happen? And you know, the argument, obviously our position is, you know, the person who's driving the car away, you couldn't rob the bank if you didn't have that person doing what they did. You couldn't rob the bank if somebody wasn't standing guard. You couldn't rob the bank if, if there wasn't someone holding up any tellers or guards inside. So despite the fact that it may be just one person who actually goes in and gets the money, everyone under Indiana law is, is liable or guilty of committing bank robbery. The other angle we had to go or we had to move forward on was the uh, idea of conspiracy. Conspiracy gets a little more complicated. Um, it's basically showing an agreement between other people to commit that felony. And you have to allege that there was some sort of overt act committed in furtherance of the conspiracy. Let me try to break that down just a little bit for you so you understand. Um, when you have multiple individuals that appear to have acted in concert to have something happen, you don't normally have people sitting around discussing their plans, saying, well, we're all agreeing that we're going to go rob a bank, right? No. Uh, in fact, the, the Supreme Court has said that you know, we're not required as prosecutors to prove that there's an express formal agreement to prove that the, there, is an ex, there is a conspiracy. It can be inferred from circumstantial evidence or overt acts of the parties within, uh, within the case. And the reason that that was important uh, was, again, because you had uh, various actors in this case at various points. Some people at the Lowe's, some people at the studio. But all, obviously, uh, when we looked at the ad evidence in the aggregate or in the whole, were acting to have this final, this final goal, this final act, that being confining these two individuals, Marvin Finney and Thomas Keyes, and ultimately trying to get this information out of them and ultimately uh, trying to end both of their lives. Unfortunately, it didn't happen uh, to Martin Finney. Now, when I got this case, as you can imagine, uh, I recognized pretty quickly that it was a monster of a case. There was uh, an enormous amount of evidence available uh, in terms of what we had to sift through. Phone records, DNA, firearms, forensics, uh, multiple interviews with various subjects in this case. We'll discuss that a little bit going forward. So it was very clear from the outset that this was going to um, this was going to take quite a bit of time. When we got to the point of going forward with trial, after you know working with all of our various witnesses, um, 20 to 25, depending on uh, the number of people we needed, 
and also the amount of evidence that we all ended up submitting, which was over 200 pieces of evidence in each of the trials that we did in this particular case. And there was a lot of work leading up to, to the trial in this particular matter. The first trial in this case, October 21st of 2013, <coughs> was against three individuals, I think James McDuffie, Dante Robinson, and Nathaniel Armstrong. We ultimately ended up trying this case four different times, and you may wonder why on earth I would want to do that to myself. That was not, uh, that was not the intent, to just keep trying the case at the same time. All joking aside, obviously any time that we can, we can try a case only once and, and get it done that way, we are going to do that. It was difficult in this particular case uh, for a number of reasons that we'll discuss shortly. But when you have this many defendants and this many defense attorneys involved, you have varying degrees of preparedness by the defense counsel. Some may say, I'm not ready. Some may say, I am. And if there's anything that's true in Indiana law that I've learned in my years as prosecutor, the court tries to force a defense attorney to go to trial when they say they aren't ready. You might as well just get ready to do it over again because it's going to be reversed on appeal. There were also some statements that were given by various defendants in this case, and we'll talk a little bit about that going forward. But again, you know, we wanted to try this as few times as possible, uh, specifically, you know, for the sake of the family. Um, it's a very difficult process to have to sit through and go through trial, obviously, to sit through and hear the evidence about something, especially a situation or an incident as awful as this one, um, and, and to have to listen to that, and specifically for Marvin Finney who I can only imagine how truly terrible this experience was to, to live through and then to have to testify about four different times while the people who did this to you are sitting you know, within 20 feet staring at you the entire time that you're testifying. So we had to <coughs> consider a few things uh, going forward our trial strategy was basically to make sure that the jurors understood what conspiracy and accomplice liability were and how that worked within the framework of, of what was going on in this particular case. As you'll see, James McDuffie, you know, we had on videotape at the Lowe's uh, buying these materials. So we'd have him at the outset clearly involved. Uh, but Dante Robinson and Nathaniel Armstrong, the other two, they're at the studio later, after the fact, after all that initial planning happens. So we wanted to make sure we understood, or we, we discussed with the jurors during the jury selection process that occurs on the first day, uh, discuss with them what those concept means and make sure that people understand and make sure that if there are any individuals who are you know, ardently against or, or firmly against any of those theories of criminal liability that, that we make sure that they don't end up on the jury. And so that was a part as of you, our... As you, as you prepare, as you get to that point in talking about talking to the jury, as you prepare for any trial, this trial or any trial, do you develop a theme uh, for, for the trial and then try to weave that through every aspect of the case? Absolutely. Uh, pretty quickly on, or pretty early on, you will recognize in any given case what, what the issue may boil down to. It's pretty rare that we have a case where you have so much evidence that there's not a whole lot that you're going to have to worry about or, or argue about in terms of uh, showing that the defendant is in fact guilty of whatever it is he's charged with. So early on, you, you have to identify what is the potential weakness in this case and, and how do you work into a theme, uh, how do you work into um, your presentation, not only in your opening statement, but through the evidence that you ultimately present to the jury. How do you present that theme in a way that gets across uh, some of these concepts like conspiracy or, or accomplice liability and shows them why that's important, shows them why that law is, is what it is in a case like this. And that is definitely something we, we did in this particular case because we wanted to make sure, again, you know, we had varying degrees or various levels of evidence uh, level against in each of these individuals and, and different types of evidence against each of these individuals and different strengths of evidence. So that was very important. Um, one thing that we didn't, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit in a bit, one thing we just we didn't quite count on was um, how difficult it would be for the jury to uh, find someone guilty based on Marvin Finney's testimony. Um, 
that was the case with the individual in the middle, Dante Robinson. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Some of the most powerful uh, evidence that we presented, especially against James McDuffie in this particular trial, were uh, clips of video from the Lowe's. And I want to show you just a few clips of that so that you have an idea of what the jury saw during the course of this trial and why it was so compelling for them. And Ross, before that place, yes. um, you know, as you prepare for trial, like this trial and any trial, <coughs> it's uh, very important that you think through the order of the presentation of evidence. Absolutely. You know, we can, we can only control so much, but it, you know, to the best of our ability, we'd like it to be chronological. We'd like it to make sense, you know, in terms of time. Uh, it's not a perfect world, and that really happens, unfortunately, when we're talking about 20 or 25 witnesses. Everybody has different schedules. Sometimes our, our law enforcement or our uh, crime lab witnesses are in other trials and other courtrooms. And that can obviously you know, create a problem in terms of our, our time frame or our, our presentation of evidence. But yes, we do, to the best of our ability, present it chronologically. Or you, know, you look at each day of a trial, if it's a multi-day trial, as, as it was for this first case, uh, four days uh, in total presenting evidence, and you want to think, you know, each day you're going to start with something and you're going to end with something. And primacy and recency tells us that you want to have some sort of impact at those moments. So you also kind of plan for ending on something strong. You don't want to end on a, a whimper of a witness who doesn't really add much. Or if you have a witness who's not very helpful or actually, you know, it's hurting your case, maybe you put them somewhere else in the order of witnesses. It just depends all on what you're trying to achieve in terms of your impact on the jury. Because ultimately it is, uh, you, know, you are trying to persuade the jury to uh, a verdict in a particular case. So yes, that is definitely something uh, that we are consciously looking at. And I think you're always, I think all of us, you know, you, we do trials, you know, if you live with a case for so long, you know, whether it's one year or whatever, you know every uh, nuance of the entire case and we have to step back and realize 12 people are going to hear this for the first time. We've lived it to know everything. Absolutely. And I'd say, you know, Early on in my career, that, that would be a classic mistake that I made, I think, a couple different times. Uh, I know that case so well, but I think everybody else knows that case so well. So when I present it, it's like, well, how did they not get this and this and this? And so, well, you didn't explain it to them, that's why. <laughs> so it, it, it definitely is something that, um, it, part of the reason we have two different prosecutors sitting on any given trial in Marion County is for that fact. You want somebody who's the lead prosecutor, you also want somebody who's um, helping on the case, but maybe hasn't memorized every page and every document, who can sit back and, and, and ask you those questions. You may think you understand something, but then at that point, uh, they may say, well, why are, you, why are you doing this, or can you explain to me this? And that's very helpful um, in, in terms of your presentation of evidence. One second, we'll get some video. These two individuals are Darren Jackson in the front in the lighter colored shirt, and behind him are Carl to Hart. And I think, let me back up just a moment here. Right before they came in, uh, James McDuffie comes in with a shopping cart. This is James McDuffie walking in, and you'll notice that he stops and grabs something out of one of these uh, bins right here. And that's significant because the loss prevention officer, uh, Braden Pothier, said normally, you know, he's just kind of watching people as they come and go, but anytime somebody walks in and grabs a box cutter, that immediately sets off some alarm bells in his mind. Because typically what folks will do is they'll take a box cutter and then use it to cut uh, you know, more valuable items out of like their security binding, some of the packaging that they come in. So that immediately kind of caught his attention and was why he was uh, paying attention to what this particular group was doing. Out
pause it right here. At this point, the loss prevention manager is has been watching them. He's actually controlling the cameras and, and making the cameras adjust to, to follow them. And here you have Darren Jackson on the right and James McGuffey on the left. And as you can see, uh, they're holding what appear to be bags of zip ties. And this is what caught the loss prevention officer's attention. If you didn't catch it at a couple different points, Darren Jackson is either crossing his wrists or holding the zip ties up to his wrists. And that's what the loss prevention manager said really kind of made him wonder what was going on. Because up to that point, he had seen some of the items they'd picked up, and as he later would testify in trial, he's always kind of wondering what home project people are going to do with the things that they buy. And so when he saw this combination of duct tape, zip ties, and a box cutter, he, he said it was probably something good. He continued to watch um, all of these individuals, but mostly focusing on James McDuffie. Uh, but as you'll see, James McDuffie then meets up with Carlton Hart here shortly. And Carlton Hart has grabbed a rather large, I think it's a two by four, and adds it to the card. And this is significant later in Carlton Hart's trial. And then ultimately they check out together. Um, again, you'll see Carlton Hart meet up with James McDuffie, just as we saw in the last video. And another another great thing about Lowe's is that they had so many different camera ang angles that we could basically follow them around the entire store, watching what they did. Carlton Hart then joins James McDuffie as well as Darren Jackson, Darren Jackson and as we'll see shortly, um, they all check out together and then after that they walk out to the same car and drive away. So we, we had some pretty good Lowe's video that we presented. Another interesting fact was that James McDuffie paid for all of those items with a gift card. And the loss prevention manager, when we subsequently talked to him, said, I can figure out who got that gift card. And, and they should have given some identification or information whenever they received it. So we actually pulled up the video from the week before showing James McDuffie returning some items and getting the gift card that ultimately gave him you know, the money to purchase the zip ties. And he pulled the receipt for us um, from that transaction. If you can see, I'll zoom in a little bit on the bottom here. There's James McDuffie's name. It's not spelled correctly, but there he is. His address and his signature from, from that gift card transaction. As I also uh, mentioned, there was a package of zip ties inside the studio itself. When Detective Sheminar first walked in there and saw that package, not only did he scan the barcode on there, he also could tell that there was a fingerprint on the plastic itself, just by visually looking at it. So obviously he collected that and that was processed, and <coughs> that fingerprint came back to match James McDuffie. Not only that, Marvin Finney identified James McDuffie in a photo array, and there is a legal term for someone with that much evidence facing them in a trial, 
Uh, it's screwed. I've <laughs> <laughs> heard that legal term before. Okay. <laughs> so we presented all of our evidence, and you know we had some uh, good evidence against Mr. McDuffie, obviously, uh, Nathaniel Armstrong. Uh, we had some good evidence, as well as some civilians who testified about him bragging after the fact uh, about the murder. Dante Robinson, again, the only thing that we had on him was Marvin Finney uh, saying that he knew who he was and that, that this was the person who had terrorized you know, he and, and Thomas Keyes. We started on a Monday, we gave the case to the jury on a Thursday, and about like two or three. Four o'clock on Wednesday, I'm sorry. And whenever a jury deliberates, they can deliberate as long as they need to. We can't control that part of the process. So while that's happening, we just have to wait around in case there's a question or there's some sort of legal issue that arises. And so they started deliberating, and deliberating, and deliberating. As soon as it was 10 o'clock at night, then it was 11, then it was 12, and as soon as it was 1 o'clock the next morning, then 2, then 3, 4, Five and six, and this whole time, you know, we're waiting. We're wondering what's going on. Fourteen and a half hours later, after some of us slept in the courtroom for most of the night, the jury did come back with verdicts and convicted both uh, James McDuffie and Nathaniel Armstrong on all counts, but hung as to Dante Robinson. That is, they couldn't reach a verdict. They couldn't all unanimously agree about. Um, whether or not he was guilty of the crimes that we charged him with. What that meant legally was that, uh, not, that he, not that he got a free pass, he stayed in custody, but we would have to try him again. Not only that, James McDuffie was a habitual offender. So after 14 hours of deliberation and, and being in the courtroom all night, we had to move to a second phase to find him a habitual offender and present additional evidence. It was a long, long, long haul but we did uh, finally get also the habitual offender enhancement found guilty on Mr. What McDuffie. evidence do you have to present in the habitual phase? So habitual, it's different than what you may have heard uh, from California or some of these other jurisdictions. It's not three strikes or out. Uh, there's actually a statute that talks about what makes you a habitual offender. Uh, the various equations, a couple of prior felony convictions typically of various levels. Um, and those can subject you to a sentence enhancement and talk about that just a little bit. Our second trial was against Darren Jackson and part of the challenge obviously with Darren Jackson's case is that he's clearly on the video at Lowe's and he's clearly helping buy some of those items but we didn't have him at the studio. So ultimately we only charged him with a couple different crimes, conspiracy to commit kidnapping and conspiracy to commit criminal confinement. That being him planning and uh, plotting with James McDuffie and Carlton Hart, the minimum, to do what they did. We didn't have enough evidence on the other end to show that he uh, either participated or planned in the ultimate murder. So those were the strong charges, or those were the charges that we believe we could go forward on. In the jury selection process, we again hit some of these, these points about uh, accomplice liability. In trial, the defense, um, really attacked whether or not we could even present evidence about what the other co-defendants had said during the course of what happened at the studio, arguing it was hearsay. Uh, we ultimately won that challenge. Uh, we argued that it was in the course of the conspiracy and under Indiana law, uh, you could admit certain hearsay statements uh, made by co-conspirators in a situation like that. So we did get to present the evidence from the Lowe's as well as everything that Marvin Finney heard and, and was told to him by the other co-defendants inside the studio. He also tried to say that he was at work at the time that this particular uh, crime occurred. We actually went to his place of employment, which was Wendy's, uh, which um, under the name of Trident Foods, and his manager got us his work schedule for that day. Uh, it may be a little hard for you to see, but the 15th, Darren Jackson is scheduled to be there, but he was originally scheduled to be there from 2 to 6, and that was changed uh, from 6 to close, so he was definitely uh, around and available during the time that he was at Lowe's buying these items and uh, ultimately going back to the studio to set things up with Carlton Hart. 
Another key factor for us and something that we prosecutors uh, routinely look for are telephone calls from the Marion County Jail. Obviously with the number of charges these individuals were facing, including murder, they were in custody and they were making calls from jail, all six of them. I think I personally spent at least over 150 hours listening to jail calls from each of these, collectively each of these individuals. Sometimes it pays off and sometimes it does not, but in this particular case with, with Darren Jackson, it did. Uh, during one of his jail calls, when it was very clear that he, he didn't understand what was on the Lowe's video, only that we had it, he tried to tell a story to his father that you know, he didn't know what James McDuffie was buying. Um, in fact, he wasn't really near him when he picked out the zip ties. He was just there trying to buy some security equipment for Carlton Hart's student. Well, as you saw, he's right there comparing all those things to his wrists and the sizes and really came back to bite him in the trial. And ultimately, he was found guilty of uh, conspiracy to commit criminal confinement, but not the conspiracy to commit kidnapping. And um, I think at the end of the day, both Jeremy and I understand why the jury came to that decision. The kidnapping statute, was, as it was written at the time, was pretty confusing. Um, so ultimately, however, we were happy to get that conviction on it. Ross, going back to the uh, jail calls, our individuals in and custody advise that their calls be monitored? Yes, they are, and it always stuns me after hearing multiple advisements <laughs> that there's a sign there that says your calls will be recorded. There's a, a very friendly voice that says your calls will be monitored and are subject to recording. If you've ever listened to Serial, that's the beginning of every episode of Serial. Uh, and it's, it's the same thing. It tells them that it's going to be recorded. And I've had defendants, you know, immediately after, after hearing that saying, well, yeah, I set that fire and I killed them. It was my fault. I mean, literally, those kind of admissions. It's, it's stunning to me. Something about just you know, getting on the phone. You just want to unburden their soul or something like that. I don't know. Our third trial, March 24th, 2014. As you can see, these kind of happened in quick succession. Uh, Carlton Hart was tried. Again, this was a very difficult trial because we had him at the studio or at the uh, Lowe's at the front end, but not the ultimate act, uh, the, the murder and the attempt murder inside the studio. But it was his, thank you, it was his studio where this all occurred. And some other facts that we were able to point to the jury. He ultimately was charged with the, the uh, quite a few of the charges that we had listed up there, including the murder and conspiracy to commit murder. And in the jury selection process, again, we hit, we hit on those specific factors, and really we had, to, we had to rely on what was really the best evidence were the statements that he gave to us. Carlton Hart gave multiple statements to Detective Schemenauer, and each time he did, something in his statement changed. As he learned new facts, he would adjust his story. It started that, that he didn't know anything about the Lowe's or, or what had happened. He hadn't gone there. Um, he had just been spending time with Darren Jackson. And then slowly it evolves to ultimately where, where he realizes that we have video of him close, where, where he offers this explanation. You may be able to hear it, but I'll definitely let you read it. So he, the person he's referring to, of course, is James McDuffie trying to say, well, I, you know, he's trying to hide it from him. Well, we took still photos from the video <laughs> where he's looking inside the cart or standing right there as James McDuffie buys the items through the entire process. And I, I think that was pretty, he painted himself into a corner that he simply could not get out of. One other interesting factor that, that is important for prosecutors are cell phone records, and those can be important for a variety of reasons. In this particular case, we did have cell phone records for some of these individuals, and cell phone records can give you a couple different things. They can give you uh, what kind of calls were made, when calls were made, the numbers to and from, et cetera, but it also can give you cell tower locations. And if you're not familiar with it, you know, the, the now ubiquitous cell tower that we see around our city and everywhere in the country, every time you take out your cell phone and, and use it, your cell phone is connecting with the tower. And when it connects with the tower, there's a record of that made. 
And not because the cell phone companies are trying to track where you are, but because for their purposes, they need to know how much traffic any particular tower is getting. Uh, they need to know, do they need more coverage in surgery or less coverage? Well, it's useful for us as prosecutors because that can also help you know where somebody is or isn't at a particular time during the day. And with cell phone towers, although it's not an exact GPS of a location of an individual, it's a pretty good idea of where they were or where they were not. Uh, in Carlton Hart's case, we were able to get his cell phone records. And uh, we knew his number because Detective Schemenauer got it from him during the course of his interviews. And that's important because we need to link a number to a defendant, otherwise that's not going to come into evidence. Ultimately, what we can do with that cell tower information is take it and put it on a map and show a jury you know, where was this cell phone connecting at certain times throughout a day, and specifically in relation to a crime. I just want to show you a couple of examples of what we were able to show the jury. You can see here, this is kind of a map of, of downtown Indianapolis and, and north of Indianapolis. You see the Lowe's March as well as the 2044 East 46th Street. That's where the studio was located. Um, right around that, you, you can see a couple triangles that the arrow was pointing away from and to. Those are cell tower, representative cell towers. And on the bottom right, you can see the date as well as the time that that particular call was made that connected with that particular tower. Now, Carlton Hart's story to Detective Schemenauer was that he, you know, eventually when he admitted he was at Lowe's, he just said, well, I just took Darren Jackson to the studio, we dropped some stuff off, and we left. We got out of there. Well, as you can see a progression in time, here he is at 5.03 and 5.09 p.m., you know, connecting to a tower that's directly south of 2044 and 46th Street at the studio. And that particular picture shows you what is known as sector information, because we can tell you not only what tower the phone connected to, but what side of the tower connected to. So from this map, you can see not only it was connected to a, a tower close to the studio at that time, but it also was coming from the direction of where the studio was. Again, 511, 513, more calls, again, connecting to a tower in that area, consistent with him being at the location of the studio. Finally, 523, 526, again, back at that same tower, showing him in that exact area, contrary to his story of just dropping some stuff off and leaving. He was ultimately convicted uh, based on not only his statements, but also on that cell tower information. Final trial, the retrial of Dante Robinson and the final defendant, Dominic Handler. Our trial strategy obviously changed up a little bit because we knew that um, <coughs> the jury was going to need a little more uh, a little more argument and a little more understanding from us about why, why they could rely on Martin Finney's testimony when we said that Dante Robinson uh, is the person who did what he did. So in the jury selection process, we really made sure that we focused on, you know, what is eyewitness identification to you and, and what kind of factors make you think it's a stronger thing to rely on or a weaker? Because a lot of people have an idea of eyewitness identification just being weak. Because you've heard, you know, I'm sure you've heard things about eyewitness identification being unreliable. Well, this is a different situation. Uh, this is not some shadowy figure pointing a gun at you in an alley in the dark in the middle of the night. This is somebody you knew. This is somebody who you have uh, seen before in YouTube videos, and this is somebody you spent over two hours with as they interrogated you, pointed a gun at you. And so we really uh, emphasized that point to the jury that, that there's no mistake in this person after you've spent that kind of time with them. In the trial process, we also presented some DNA evidence of Dominic Hamler, and there was some DNA of his on one of the zip ties, as well as some, cell, some telephone records of his own, again, uh, as you can see, 3.30 to 5.25 p.m., same tower that put Carlton Hart right there, put him right in that same area as well at the studio. Uh, subsequent slide, 5.50, 5.55 p.m., again, right there at the studio, and that's pretty compelling stuff for a jury to see. just want to talk about sentencing really quickly because there are a number of, of different sentence, uh, sentences that they received. James McDuffie received ultimately 185 years uh, for, for his crimes, and he was pretty much maxed out by the trial court judge who said this is one of the worst crimes that I've seen and it deserves one of the harshest sentences that I can hand out, which included the habitual offender enhancement. <coughs> Nathaniel Armstrong, 175 years, he was given uh, that, that amount based on a criminal gang enhancement for his prior, uh, prior gang association, which enhances certain offenses. He also received 
a maximum sentence. Darren Jackson, because he was only found guilty of conspiracy to commit criminal confinement, was given 18 years. It was a 20 year maximum sentence. So he got most of what he possibly could have received based on that. But um, in considering what everyone else got, uh, I think got off pretty easy. Carlton Hart ultimately was convicted of murder and criminal confinement, given 65 years. And then Dante Robinson and Donald Handler, each for their respective parts and roles inside that studio, received 140 years. Seven hundred and twenty three years total between all defendants. I just want to talk about the appellate process for just one minute and I'll wrap it up. Um, each of these individuals did uh, attempt an appeal and all uh, all of their appeals were denied or, or failed at the appellate level. Uh, James McDuffie is the only one who had some change to his, his underlying conviction, but it didn't change his overall sentence. Everyone else appealed various aspects of either their sentence or the, or the, the evidence and were not successful. They even requested uh, subsequent transfer or review by the Indiana Supreme Court, who, who all, who, and they were all denied uh, that uh, transfer to the Supreme Court. That doesn't mean you can't uh, continue with other avenues, but at this point they've exhausted most of their appeals. So Ross, I have a, a couple of follow-up questions and we'll open up to questions from um, First of all, um, the, those who were here last week heard from Vanita Farrow, who was the victim advocate in this case, who talked about her role in terms of keeping the, the family advised. As the deputy prosecutors, do you also uh, keep constantly in contact with the victim's family? Absolutely, and the victim advocates play an invaluable role in making sure that we don't, um, you know, hearings are changing constantly, things are getting reset, and they play an invaluable role in making sure that we get uh, good contact with the family. We are also in contact with the families. I give my cell phone out to every family on every homicide and I tell them to call me uh, day or night because sometimes they'll hear rumors on the street that somebody's getting out or they have a question or whatever it may be and I want them to, to know that I'm available whenever they need to to talk about an issue. And um, on this particular point, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to add, um, you know, uh, having been through this trial with this family so many times, I. You know, my heart goes out to them and uh, the difficulty of, of this case and the situation. I don't know if it was shared last time, but I did talk to the, to the family, uh, to Thomas Key's dad. He said it was all right, I could share this. Thomas Keyes was an organ donor, and because of his donation, I think it was six or, six or seven, seven people um, received, you know, life-saving life or life-altering uh, transplants from him. So I. Yeah, that's legacy. Talking about the family members, Ross, uh, uh, you talked about what a horrible ordeal it was for Marvin Finney, and was uh, Marvin's mother very instrumental in kind of you know, helping him through that process? Absolutely, and in fact, we, we really could not have done this without her. He and as anyone could understand, he, he didn't want to talk about this. He didn't want to meet with us. He didn't want to come to trial. Uh, you know, despite our efforts, you know, having gone through something like that, I can only imagine the thought of having to, again, be in front of these folks and, and talk about what they did. Uh, but his mother was instrumental in making sure that he came to his meetings. He came to every trial, and he did what he needed to do. Gets me choked up every time to think about it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, just a really important part of the process. One last uh, question to share with the, uh, the group. Um, Carl Hart had actually beaten a murder a year or two prior to this? He had. Hmm. In fact, he had sued the city of Indianapolis for, I think, a million or two million dollars. And um, I love listening to his jail calls bef both before and after, as you can imagine. Before, he was talking about everything he was going to do to spend all that two million dollars. And then after, his tune had changed a little bit. So that was... Yeah, and, and ultimately that, that went nowhere, and that was dismissed, and uh, he's, he's right where he needs to be. Uh, that, questions? What is the difference between a conviction of 185 years, 175, 170 versus just giving them life? Um, isn't it the same thing? Yes, uh, the question was, 
you know, why give them, you know, 185 or 175, why not just give them life? Only because there's a legal distinction in Indiana. I mean, effectively, yes, it is a life sentence. Um, we do have life without parole, which is a separate filing that, that can be done. There's additional things you have to do and extra steps you have to jump through and, and aggravating factors you have to show to have that kind of an enhancement on a murder. Um, in this case, because of the number of charges, we knew that if convicted, the sentence that they would receive would effectively be a life sentence. Because even if they get credit for all the time that they do, which they could potentially cut that sentence in half under the old code, it's still obviously not a situation where they can get out. So yes, there, there is a distinction, there is a difference, but sometimes we look at the facts and say, you know, why file that on top of, of these charges when if they are convicted, that's what they will effectively receive. Very good question. In Indiana, and state state rules are a little different than federal rules, but Indiana, we have to automatically discover or give over everything that we have within a certain deadline. So there's no surprises at trial. There's no, we give it to you maybe a week before. They had this evidence probably, yeah, this, you know, within, within a month of us filing the case, they would have had the majority of this evidence. Obviously, there are things that we develop as evidence going forward including you know, DNA testing, which takes some time, or some of these other uh, forensic things that we have to do. But you know, as soon as we have it, they have it. And that's a pretty strict rule uh, here in Indiana. So they go in knowing very well what we intend to present and, and what evidence we have. We are sometimes at a disadvantage because we don't know quite what their, what their take is or what their defense is going to be. So, um, but I think those, those rules are there for a reason, and I think it's a very good reason that they're reprised of everything before, um, before trial. We'll start with the double jeopardy. When, when a trial hangs, it, there is no ultimate judgment or conviction. It's considered a mistrial. Um, if we had tried him and he was found not guilty, that's when double jeopardy kicks in, where you cannot retry him on those facts in any shape or form. Uh, there are very narrow exceptions you know, in, in military law and rules. Um, second part of your question, I'm sorry. Gang. Okay. Yeah, the, same the gang enhancement that we filed is actually a sentence enhancement. There are criminal gang uh, crimes or statutes that, that criminalize you know, people acting in concert like this. They're fairly low-level felonies. So you know, in a situation like this where we have you know, the kind of charges that we had, it, it didn't seem necessary and, you know, for, our, for our sentencing purposes or for our charging purposes in terms of getting our evidence. Does that, does that make some sense? Right, and there are certain circumstances where that would help bring in certain pieces of evidence into a case that you may not otherwise be able to do if you didn't file it that way. Um, also, uh, as to that particular defendant, there was some more different evidence we had on him particularly that we could put in, in, in front of the judge that we didn't have on everybody else, so it wasn't what it meant is likely to succeed with the other defendants on that one. I have three uh, really curious <coughs> What was their actual defense? Did they say, I'm guilty or I'm a little guilty? Um, did they try to make any plea deals? And did any of them have parole or possibility? So in terms of the defense, you know, for a couple of these folks, when you're on video buying these things on Lowe's, 
you almost feel sorry for the defense attorney who's trying to make some sort of argument out of it. You know, like I, you know, his fingerprints on the package, he's identified, he's at the, he's on the, I mean, he, he did his best. You know, the argument basically is, well, that's not enough to, you know, it's not sufficient to convict on these charges. That's the best, you know, sometimes that you can do. And did they try to say, okay, well, who was five years instead of ten years? Or what? Well, Dante Robinson was the only person who, who I think, Kind of made that approach, and we ultimately said, "Well, you know, the deal that we're going to give you is you're going to have to plead guilty to murder. It's not like we're going to reduce this, and you'd have to testify against all these individuals." And ultimately, he was not willing to do that. So. May we ask, Judge Burr? Was it done? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let Ross recognize someone rather than shouting out questions. So I think we recognize someone back there, Ross. Yeah, one last uh, about the parole. We don't have parole in Indiana, as, as you may think. It's it's strictly a credit time question. Uh, you don't you don't go before the parole board and have them determine when you're released. You do your time, and if you get your credit time, then you are. Then you will be placed on parole. But it's not like there's a board who's determining when you come or go. Okay. I mean, how many of them had um, private attorneys in public? I think just one. I think just Dante Robinson had a private attorney. Ted Mitchell's. Everybody else was either a contract attorney or a public defender. Did Dante have the less time? That he got 140. It was Darren Jackson. I think that got him. I'd go to this side of the room. Is there anyone that had a question? Who were the judges of the court? Uh, Judge, the Honorable Judge Lisa Borges in criminal court number four presided over all four of those trials, so she was very familiar with those facts by the end of it, as, as we were. Excellent. Thank you. All right, thank you. 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 Thank the closest that we could understand as to why this group of individuals targeted Thomas Keyes and, and Martin Finney was, a, a, I guess, kind of a game of telephone that went awfully wrong. Um, Thomas Keyes was heard talking about the fact that Van Gogh had been murdered with somebody else, which someone misinterpreted as him bragging about that happening. And unfortunately, that's you know kind of what led to this whole series of events. So the criminal confinement basically means that you restricted the liberty of a person, that somehow you, you impeded them or kept them from, you know, and, and obviously with zip ties, that's an easy call uh, to say that you can find somebody. But it gets a little more uh, difficult when you say, did you block them in a room where they couldn't leave the room? Well, we weren't dealing with that. So the confinement wasn't difficult. The kidnapping was difficult because it was a confusing statute. It's actually been repealed. Or did they? Yeah, it was repealed back then. So it's actually been repealed. I think part of the reason was because of the confusion. But it was basically saying you, you can find somebody, but you also move them from one yeah. location yeah. to a next, to another, to another, and that you know, is kind of difficult to show uh, in this particular case. Um, I wanted to know why were all of the charges murder, even though all of them were in conspiracy and had this plan to kill this, these two individuals? Why would they all charge with murder? So, yeah, Darren Jackson, that was a very difficult call for us. Um, ultimately, we decided that because because the evidence that we had was of conspiracy at Lowe's, you know, to confine based on the binding zip ties and the head of duct tape. Ultimately, we did not have the evidence that we had, say, against Carlton Hart, who owned that studio, who, who did sort of subsequent to that, a phone record showing he was there. We just couldn't put Darren Jackson at that location, you know, after the, the procurement of the items from the clothes. And that was the difficulty in saying, you know, our, our opinion was that even if we convicted him of that, the Court of Appeals might have said, you know, nice try, for lack of a better word. So that, it was a difficult decision, and we waited, you know, whether or not to do that, but we just, um, we didn't think it would be successful. O overreaching, yeah, I mean, and that's something you never want to do with the jury, is, you know, them to think that you've just piled on trying to get them to be charged to stay. Like what, 
his family is here, and he's yeah. I mean, as, as well as you could do under these fads. Um, you know, I'm sure it's been difficult. I'm sure, you know, we we wanted to have him go into counseling right away. He was very resistant to that. I mean, it's I just can't imagine how working through that process would be. But um, he's. Seems like very early on from what we heard last week, a lot of things just kind of fell into place. That's kind of unusual, isn't it? It is, um, but it does happen, and sometimes it is really just a random you know, buck the draw. And another question: What was the total cost for all of these? I don't actually. Yeah, she asked about the total cost for all the time. I actually don't know that. Um, I'm sure. I can assure you, we don't get paid overtime. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, a lot, I know a lot of man hours, a lot of people are involved, and for that many trials. Right. And curious. when the public defenders, they're, they're paid a salary oh. just like ours. The contract attorneys are a salary also, aren't they? Yes. And by contract attorneys, what they're referring to is. In a case where there's multiple defendants, then it would be a conflict for the public defender's office to represent all the defendants. Uh, and so the public defender's office has what's called contract attorneys who then take defendants in multiple defendant cases so that there's not that conflict in the office. And so they're also salary, receive a salary. So I, I don't really know that there would be any significant extraordinary cost other than if we had to bring witnesses in or put them up, that sort of thing. I have one question. You, you talked about confinement and the kidnapping charges. Were you able to determine who fired the shots? Our, our best guess is that it was Nathaniel Armstrong. Um, Marvin said that you could only describe someone with, with uh, braids, uh, the outline of a finger with braids coming back in and pointing the gun and firing it. Um, we suspect Nathaniel Armstrong because we also suspected him for several other murders. Uh, and he seemed to be one of the main, I guess, provocateurs or hype man that was in there trying to get everybody else, you know, where some people would say, well, maybe these guys don't know anything. He would ramp it back up and say, no, we got to do this for bang, though. And so he seemed pretty, pretty bent on having somebody pay. I'd love to know the difference between murder and felony murder. Mm -hmm. Very good question. The difference between murder and felony murder. Um, Sometimes we hold people responsible for intentionally killing someone, that is, you know, you pull a gun and shoot somebody. Sometimes someone is killed in the course of some other felony, that is, let's say we go to a bank and we commit that robbery, and uh, a guard may pull out a gun and shoot at you and hit somebody else. Well, you didn't shoot that, the defendant didn't shoot that person, but because of what you did, you're responsible for causing a death in the course of a felony. And it's not all felonies, it's only certain felonies that the legislature has determined are so dangerous that being, you know, robbery or arson or some of these things. Like, well, you know that there's a high probability somebody could get shot and killed. So if somebody dies, it's a matter if you pulled the trigger, somebody was trying to defend themselves and killed someone else, um, you're going to be responsible for that. Ross, question? Are y'all not sure who was the killer at the scene? As, as crazy as it sounds, yes, that's correct. We can point to one of, you know, the four people who were inside and who were there that, that night, but ultimately, you know, only those people know who, who fired that shot. And Ross, wasn't one of the consider in terms of value, one of the, one of the considerations is that uh, Marvin Finney said there was a handgun that the individual had. Correct. And so Correct. the other individuals obviously previously had assault rifles. Right. Correct. Correct. Um, and this is more for you, Prosecutor Curry. Um, since that, that mother was just a great mother, and, and I don't even know if she'd be willing to do this, but you know, we've had the cases recently where the parents haven't um, wanted their kids to, to help. And first of all, I just want to say I'm never going to tell a parent what to do. They have to do what they feel is best for their family. But if that mom's willing, maybe that mom can go to different conferences, talk to different student bodies, uh, like at the Black Expo or different uh, community events, and if she's willing to do that, to just talk in general to the parents out there and the grandparents that, uh, you know, why she felt it was important that she helped her son get through it, because her son 
traumatized, didn't want to do it. And because um, I could see that mom, if she's willing to do it, to go nationally, being on Dr. Field talking about it. I mean, because, because you have to understand, people are scared, legitimately so, about their kids being involved in something like that. And so you, you need to hear from somebody like her why she did it. Um, and I think that would help. But I, I, and, I, and she may not want to, you know, but, no, I, but, I, I, but I, I agree 100%. And uh, you know, we, we actually, one of our victim advocates has had uh, more than one uh, family member who was murdered, and she speaks about it. Uh, Ms. Deborah Watson has, has done the same, including uh, presenting at this, uh, this uh, CJA in prior years. Um, Pro excuse me, Pro yes, what yes, the sir. group doesn't realize, Martin was here last week. Yeah, I, I did not realize that until, <laughs> yeah. until after. He was not in here during the presentation. No, but he was out in the... Yeah, yeah. I was told the next day that, that he was here. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that you were all talking to him along with right. his mother. So I did not know that until the next day. As well. Thank you. And what I was told was he's doing very well. That he's, he finished photography school. Um, I'm sure uh, Ross and Jeremy would gladly stay around and answer any other yes, questions. Yes, boss. <laughs> <laughs> but his wife is <laughs> me. Good answer. Um, and and uh, um, in that regard, and obviously most of you were here last week, but anyway, we're not here. Uh, members of, uh, of uh, Thomas Key's family are here. If, if you wouldn't mind to introduce yourself again so that those who were not here. Harold Keyes, Thomas's father. Harold Keyes, the oldest brother. And another thing, the Ross, he promised the family there would be no plea deals done with the independence. He's a man of his word. He's kept his word. To the Amen. One last thing I was going to share um, before we go to the uh, um, door prizes. Um, in 2017, so far this year, year to date, uh, we have taken uh, 37 murder and attempt murder cases to trial this year alone. How many cases, how many trials you had this year, Ross? Seven murders. Jeremy? I think I've had two, but it's the first Yeah, yeah, and Jeremy was in that role for a while and then transitioned into screening for us and now has moved back into a position where uh, we have four deputy prosecutors. Jeremy is one of them who essentially are point persons on homicides and actually go to the scene of virtually every uh, death in Marion County under there. Uh, from the first instance, along with a lot of them with the investigators, uh, such as the detectives showing up. So again, um, thanks for coming out tonight. Um,